Good morning, church. Let's all worship together this morning. in the hill of the Lord can I stand in that holy place there to approach the glory of my God I come toward to seek your face purify my heart purify my hands for I know it is on holy ground I'll stand I'm coming up the mountain, Lord I'm seeking you and you alone I know that I will be transformed My heart unveiled before you I'm longing for your presence, Lord Envelop me within the cloud I'm coming up the mountain, Lord My heart unveiled before you I will come Can I ascend the hill of the Lord? I stand in that holy place There to approach the glory of my God I come toward to seek your face Purify my heart, purify my hand For I know it is on holy ground I'll stand the mountain, Lord, I'm seeking you and you alone, I know that I will be transformed, my heart unveiled before you, I'm longing for your presence, Lord, envelop me within the cloud, I'm coming up the mountain. Lord, my heart unveiled before you, I will come. come to bow down I'm come to meet with you I'm come to worship I'm come to bow down I'm come to meet with you I'm come to worship I'm come to bow down I'm come to meet with you I'm come to worship I'm come to bow down I've come to meet with you I'm coming up the mountain, Lord I'm seeking you and you alone I know that I will be transformed My heart unveiled before you I'm longing for your presence, Lord Coming up 
the mountain, Lord, my heart unveiled before you. My heart unveiled before you. My heart unveiled before you. I will come. young you called my name I tried to run but still you came and just stepped into the dark cause that's just the kind of God you are when heaven seems beyond my reach you still see eternity in me you're turning ashes into art cause that's just the kind of God you are it's in the empty tomb it's on the rugged cross your death defying love is written in your scars you'll never quit on me you'll always hold my heart cause that's the kind of god you are you gave me freedom from my sin you told me i could start again all the hurt is dead and gone now we're your daughters and your sons amazing grace how sweet the sound we once were lost but now we're found forever you hold us in your arms cause that's just the kind of god you are it's in the empty tomb it's on the rugged cross your death defying love is written in your scars you'll never quit on me you'll always hold my heart cause that's the kind of god you are you are holy 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 i am set apart Holy, holy, holy God, that's who you are You are holy, holy, holy I am set apart You are holy, holy, holy God, that's who love is written in your scars you'll never quit on me you'll always hold my heart cause that's the kind of God you are it's in the empty tomb it's on the rugged cross your death defying love is written in your scars you'll never quit on me my heart cause that's the kind of God you are when I was young you called my name 
I tried to run, but still you came And you stepped into the dark Cause that's just the kind of God Thank you, church, for learning a new song with us. Father, thank you for being with us this morning. Long before we got here, maybe scrambled this morning because of a time change, you were here. You are the God that's above time. And you look down upon us with your everlasting, gracious love, compassion, and concern. And you are determined to change us to be like you. So by walking in the doors of this church, we are saying, Lord, change us. Don't allow us to be the same as individual Christians, husbands and wives, as, em, as employees to be the best employees possible of our workplace, but to be members of your body today, Lord, as we are looking at the body of Christ. So cause us to remember that we are needed, we're wanted, we are essential and important when we're connected to the body. We're not individual eyes, hands, ears, and feet running around, useless but we're part of an important body. Create that body here. We love you, Lord, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. And please be seated and welcome Pastor Richard. Good morning, FAC. God is good. And all the time. God is good. Amen. Uh, I get to do weddings from time to time, uh, and they're lots of fun. I love weddings. Um, I'm a people person, so in a wedding, you get to celebrate one of the biggest moments for people. So it's really exciting to be part of that. But then there's the after party and there's the chit-chat and all that stuff. So I'm, I'm doing a wedding uh, here in August for a softball buddy of mine, him and his lovely wife. And, you know, when you do these weddings, you focus on marriage and you go back to the scriptures and you read verses on marriage and, and whatnot. And I was reading through Hebrews 13. And there's all these little coincidences that God likes to put in our lives. And, and if we would just open up our hearts and allow them to speak to us throughout our day-to-day -day, while we're enveloping ourselves in the Scripture, you will see God. I 100% believe that if you stay connected here and you study that Word, God will speak to you time and time again. And it just further solidifies our faith. So my wife and I got to go on a date night. So, so this is the, the context. Okay, Richard's thinking about marriage. He's read Hebrews 13. My wife and I get to go on a date. Well, we're married, and we still date. Our dating looks a little different. A lot of times we just put the kids to bed, and then we play card games, which is, you know, fun. <laughs> but we're happy with that. But this time, my sister took the kids, and uh, they took all six of them, run out of the house, and my wife and I got to go out on a date. So what do we do on a date? Well, we went to Costco, you know. <laughs> we got our toilet paper and our paper towels and, you know, all that fun stuff. And then we went to this place called California Taco. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's like one of our favorite places. The owner's name is Sonia, and she is the sweetest lady. Um, and so we went there, and we got some tacos. And then the second half of our date, we went thrift shopping. So here we go, Value Village, right? Uh, that's just what we do. It's what we enjoy. So we're thrift shopping, and the beautiful thing about thrift shopping is you're taking somebody else's trash, and you're claiming it as your own treasure, Amen. right? I get to church today, and Candy lays out all these little glasswares and Tupperware things over here. And she says, let the church know that if these belong to them, take them today. Otherwise, they're going to the thrift shop, and we're getting rid of them. And so, again, you've got all these little moments that happen in your life. And when you're really about this, things like this show up. Hebrews 13 Verse 5, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Church, mere mortals will treat you like those items at the thrift shop. They will throw you away and they will consider you trash only to get picked up by another mortal to throw you away and consider you trash. God does not consider you trash. Amen. He is your helper. He is there day and night. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. No matter the context of your life, no matter the situation you're in, he is there. Amen? Amen. God is good? All the time. And all the time? God is good. 
Amen. So we're going to, uh, we have a science moment today too, um, but what we're going to do is we're going to dismiss the kids for Children's Church after the science moment. Val has a special Children's Church uh, planned for them. So if you are a little who's not in the nursery, all the way up, I'm even sending my 13-year-old son in there because I think it's special, uh, teenager, go in there and enjoy that. Um, for announcements, we do have uh, men's and women's groups on Tuesday, 6.30 here at the church. There's youth group tonight, 5.45 for all middle and high school students. I want to remind everybody, next week we are doing a little bit of a special service. We're doing a worship service. And so Brian and I are negotiating right now, because I get to preach that, that week, about 12 or 14 songs. Uh, we're negotiating it. We're going to have two halves of worship. So we're going to do an early half which with one band and then a second half with another band. It's a cool fusion. And in the middle, we're going to learn about what praise and worship look like. This is the event to invite your friends that are not part of a church body to. Because this is really just worship. It's congregational worship. And what we all know by attending here is that when we aren't part of a church body, life is tough. There's something powerful about coming into church every Sunday. Not because you have to, but because it truly does fill you. So those friends that you have that believe in Jesus, but they don't have a church family, invite them so that we can praise and worship together. Uh, that's all the announce announcements I have. So I'll have the offertorians come forward. We'll receive your tithes and offerings, and then Russ will come up and do a science moment. Let's pray. Tell me, Father, I thank you for this church, Lord. I thank you that we are not trash to you, Lord. I thank you that, that we are truly loved, that you will never leave us Lord, no matter if my life looks good, no matter if my life looks bad, Lord, no matter what situation I am in, God, you are always there. You are the only consistent and constant thing in my life, and I thank you so much that I have that. Lord, I pray that we can continue to remember that, and we remember that when we look at others around us too, Lord, that they are children of God, Lord, and let us treat them with love and respect that, that you do as well. Again, we ask that you take this offering, that you multiply it, and you'll let it only do your will from this church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Everyone welcome Russ for his science moment. Well, this is going to be a tough one. Uh, when my wife got the diagnosis for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, we were gobsmacked. But my wife had the wherewithal to ask the doctor, what can I do? And the doctor, not knowing Valerie very well, said, there's nothing you can do. Just trust the doctors. Now, that's... So we went home and immediately prayed. That was our first order of business. And then we called Pastor John, and he emailed the whole church, and you started praying. Where he got some positive feedback on that. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we went down for a PET scan, met with her aunts for lunch, because they live in Seattle. And uh, one of her aunt's daughter is a science writer for Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. And coincidentally, uh, the next day she met with the top lymphoma expert, probably one in the world. And she secured an appointment for us next Wednesday to get a second opinion. So, But uh, beyond that, beyond the prayer, which we're still doing, and, the, and covet your prayers, uh, we are researching We've probably bought over a dozen books and we're reading and have read several of them. I just wanted to share a couple things I learned about cancer because I didn't know much about it. Even being a science teacher and stuff, I just didn't really want to know much about it. Uh, now I do. And a couple things we've learned. Uh, number one is I, I believe the prevalent theory on cancer is wrong. Uh, they believe it's a genetic disease caused by mutation of the DNA. And uh, what we've been reading... Um, I think it's more of a metabolic uh, disease because uh, Otto Warburg, back in the 19, 100 years ago, 1920s, started researching cancer. He's a German scientist, won two Nobel Prizes, brilliant guy. Um, but he approached it as a metabolic disease, much like diabetes, I mean by metabolic. And uh, he discovered what they call the Warburg effect, and that's that cancer cells can only use glucose as a fuel and uh, through the process called glycolysis. And glycolysis is we take a, a glucose molecule, which is your fuel, and you split it in half, that's what glycolysis means, and you get two pyruvate molecules and two ATP molecules, which is the 
currency the body uses for energy. It's called adenosine triphosphate. So just, just two of those. That's the only way it can receive energy. A normal cell uses their mitochondria, which are the little organelles in there, but you have up to 30,000 in one cell. And they still start with that glycolysis that happens in the cytoplasm, but then those pyruvate molecules seep into the mitochondria. And within there, it goes through the magic of the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain and very complicated, but they end up with 36 ATP, a very efficient uh, machine for creating energy. And it's just one of those little nano machines that I've talked about. Um, but what, what they were on the, the cusp of, and then the 1950s, when we discovered DNA, that became the, ooh, the in vogue thing. So they studied that and they thought that was, had to be the theory because they were able to determine that, there, yeah, there was a lot of mutations in those cancer cells. So they thought that's what caused it. Um, but uh, the current research coming up is that it's not a genetic disease that is metabolic, going back 100 years, and it's because of a defective mitochondria. And uh, the, without mitochondria, because when you look at a cancer cell, those mitochondria are, are hollow. They don't have the, the inner workings to produce that. So they're operating at a very inefficient means, just two ATP, but they, um, I say, uh, cancer cells are like a, a rogue teenager. They have voracious appetites, they grow a lot, they move out, and they think they're immortal. That's exactly what cancer cells do. Um, <laughs> it's helped me think about how I have analogies to remember all this stuff. But uh, without those mitochondria, they're forced to use this glycolysis. And the other thing happens with glycolysis, if you ever try to hold out a heavy weight with your arm and your arm starts hate hurting, that's because of the lactic acid buildup. And uh, that's what happens to those pyruvate molecules when they don't go in the mitochondria, they convert to lactic acid. And uh, in, in the cancer cell, there's nowhere to go. They can't flush them out. So it forms these things called reactive oxidative uh, species. And those are things that cause mutations. They're very damaging molecules and they, they spread and it causes the mutation. So that, it's a, they're, they're studying now as the cause, it's actually an effect. Um, so we believe in this metabolic approach, and for that reason we've gone on a ketogenic diet, because we've learned that through a ketogenic diet, instead of consuming carbohydrates, which convert to glucose, we, uh, the, your body naturally, when it doesn't have enough glucose, it switches to your fat, which some of us have plenty of, and can afford, I've lost 15 pounds on this diet, so, <laughs> and Valerie too. Um, but, so by supplying with ketones, which every other cell can use, and yeah, brain even loves them. It helps you think a little clearer, which we all can use. Um, so we're operating on ketones now and minimizing those uh, sugar. So Valerie says, well, you see those cancer cells shriveling up and starving. And uh, we think that's going to help. And we've, in some studies, they, they've shown that it actually enhances the chemotherapy and the surgeries and all that stuff. We're hoping to avoid any of that. Um, so we've got one more biopsy before we have to make that decision. But uh, so this ketogenic diet is working well for us. And uh, we hope that will carry on. Another point I wanted to make. <laughs> oh, um, well, the, in all this studying, I was amazed in reading all these things of all the different proteins that are listed in these studies and books. I was unaware, as a science teacher for, you know, I got my degree 40 years ago, and I didn't know, probably 100 different proteins I'd never even heard of. And I started reflecting on how amazing that is and how God created us. Because there was a scientist named Douglas Axe, Harvard-educated scientist, and he calculated out what it would take by random chance, which is what evolutionists believe, how we all evolved, by random chance creating one functional protein, which would be very small, and he calculated there'd be one in 10 to the 77th power. And to put that in perspective, the, our galaxy has 10 to the 65th atoms. And so I'd be trying to find a needle in a haystack of a trillion Milky Way galaxies. So yeah, it's, I don't have that much faith to be an evolutionist. So that that's, it requires great faith to believe that that, that can just make one. And we have thousands of specific proteins that work together to maintain. We were talking last night with John and Diane about how we should always be sick because our body just, <laughs> should malfunction if it was like a car for goodness sake it would but uh, we're usually normally healthy so it's it's really remarkable so that was uh just kind of put that in there that and um we also we all valerie and i both listen to the daily audio bible where he reads a portion of the bible every day of the year so you finish the whole bible uh, by december 31st and it's leap year so on february 29th they had an extra day so uh, he read Psalm 139, and it really touched Valerie and myself. 
And I just want to read that to you to close. Uh, I'm going to need my glasses for this. Um, so just, I'm just going to read a portion of it. You, you, you've heard a lot of this. It said, For thou didst form my inward parts. Thou didst weed me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That's part I always remember and quote. But it continues on. Wonderful are thy works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from thee when I was made in the secret, and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Thine eyes have seen my uninformed substance, and in thy book they were all written. The days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. And just the, the thought that God has her days numbered, and whether it's two years, 20 years, 200 years, we'll accept that. And because we know our God is good. And all the time. Thank you. Let's worship together. To the cross I look To the cross I cling of its suffering I do drink Of its work I do sing I'm going to start all over Here we go cross I look and to the cross I cling of its work I do dream of its work I do sing for on it my Savior both bruised and crushed Know that God is love and God is just. At the cross, you beckon me, you draw me gently to my knees, and I am lost for words, so lost in love. I'm sweet. You call me out of death. You call me into life. It was under your wrath. Now through the cross I'm reconciled. At the cross you 
beckon me, draw me gently to my knees, and I am lost for words, so lost in love, I'm sweetly broken, holy surrendered at the cross, you beckon me, you draw me gently to my knees, and I am lost for words, so Lost in love, I'm sweetly broken, holy surrendered. Now of the cross I must confess. How wondrous redeeming love and how great is your faithfulness. Gently to my knees, and I am lost for words, so lost in love. I'm sweetly broken, holy surrendered at the cross. You beckon me, you draw me gently to my knees, and I am lost for words, so lost in love. I'm sweetly. Broken, holy surrender at the cross. You, you beckon me, you draw me gently to my knees, and I'm lost for words. So lost in love, I'm sweetly. in this place and we thank you for the gift of salvation that you give every one of us here Lord and we just bring you everything Lord and lay it down at the foot of the cross to you we give you our failures our weaknesses Lord our health we give you our relationships, our friendships, Lord. It's so important, Lord. We give you this church, Lord. Our families, our children, Lord. We just lay them all at your feet, Lord. Everything is yours. Our money, our gifts, our pride, Lord. We lay it all down for you, good and bad. Lord, we need your love and we need your forgiveness. And we need you, Lord, every moment of every day to get us through this life. Lord, we just thank you so much for the promise of everlasting life, the gift of salvation, your mercy, your grace, your kindness, your goodness. Lord, fill this place, Lord, with your spirit. As we worship you, Lord, fill us and hear our praise, Lord, and we just thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Love of 
Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. Underneath me, all around me is the current of the on your word we ask that you bless the reading of it to us and I pray this in your name amen, amen. the love of Jesus is all about starting over giving another chance like Brian said 
The scripture today comes from 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter in the NIV. If I speak with the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardships that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But when there are prophecies, they will cease. When there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection in the mirror. But then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. You know, my father, he was a, an excellent athlete. And when he, we were roller skating, he was always a skate guard. He taught me how to skate. He taught me how to keep my balance. He told me what I should do and what I shouldn't do. But every time I fell down, my father would come, start blowing the whistle, turn around backwards, block everybody, scoop me up in his arms, and take me to my mother. He let me rest a few minutes, and then he would put me right back out there. Every time I did that, he showed me his love. My father never locked me or pushed me away. My father never abandoned me. My father never left me to my own devices, no matter what I said or did. And if he were here today, he would still be doing the exact same thing. That is love. That is God's love to his children. That is God's love to the lonely and the lost. That is God's love to the undeserved and undesirable. The love of God is above everything. And we need to love and embrace it each other, hold on to each other, help each other, lift each other up, and when we can't do anything else because they won't listen, we need to pray. That is the love of God in 1 Corinthians. Amen. Amen. God, he is a true man of God. When he comes forth, he didn't say pray, he said read, but I'm going to pray. Father, I ask you to show your glory through him when he opens his mouth. Father God, let everybody in this room be blessed by the word that comes forth today. Father, I thank you and praise you that he's prepared, he's armed, he's dangerous, and he's ready. Lord, I bless your holy name to take over this service, take over our hearts, take over our ears, Lord God, that we can receive and have a desire to want to change. That is the love of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Deidre. Not so many years ago, I made my, I think it's now my second of three trips to Manhattan. I love going to Carnegie Hall. It gives me a fantasy of a life I didn't quite measure up to, but what a great place. I have a friend in, 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 on the East Coast who would invite me out. We'd go to the concerts at Carnegie Hall. One time I was out, I said, let's go to the, I think it was called The Late Show, the David Letterman Show. Was that the, was that the Late Show, or the Midnight Show, or the whatever show? Let's go to a David Letterman Show. So a few months ahead of time, I applied for tickets, and we got the tickets. And of course, it's held in the infamous, famous Ed Sullivan Theater, rather historic. So we went to the show together, and the guest that night was Emma Thompson. Could have been anybody. But as you might well know that, uh, David, Letterman, David Letterman always introduced his guests the following way. He says, he says, my next guest needs no introduction. Anybody old enough to remember any of that stuff? I have a feeling happy. Do any of you know who David Letterman is? How many of you have never heard the name David Letterman? Go ahead and fess up. Few of you, okay. But that's how I start the show. My next guest needs no introduction. Now, David's retired from the, the whole TV thing, but I think he has a podcast or some kind of online thing, which is called My Next Guest Needs No Introduction. I feel a little bit like that tonight regarding 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Our next chapter needs no introduction, does it? You all know it. So what more is there to be said? I have no idea, but I'm going to try. Are you with me, Deidre? I'm going to try my best. So we jumped ahead because of our calendar to cover the last one to four chapters of Corinthians. We skipped over the, actually skipped over the really hard stuff about um, 
angels and head coverings and things like that. You're on your own for that unless you can persuade Pastor Richard to cover this stuff. And so let's cover the last four because they deal with church life. And they also finally, the last sermon of the month will be dealing with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're going to do. So before we launch into 13, I'd just like to recap what we did in chapter 12. Chapter 12 gave us an introduction to the gifts of the Spirit. It continues in chapter 14, which we'll look at in a couple of weeks. And then kind of sandwiched in between, it's this fabulous chapter about love that is misunderstood too many times as to be a handbook on marriage love. You could actually use it for that. But primarily, it's a handbook on love in the relationship that we have in the body of Jesus Christ. We learned last week that spiritual gifts and skills and talents that God has loaned to us are intended to build up the body of Christ and glorify him, not to bring attention to ourselves. For example, chapter 12, verse 7 says, Now to each one, to everyone, to each of us, the manifestation of the Spirit is given... That would be the giftedness of the Spirit for not self-promotion, but for the common good. Even later on in chapter 14, verse 12, he says, to excelling the gifts that build up the body, Paul says. Excelling gifts that actually have a benefit to the body, not to glorify ourselves. And then we talk about two phrases last week that I suggested were, quite frankly, dirty words to never be spoken in church. They were... That as members of the church, the community of believers, we ought not to say or think these two things. Number one, I am not needed here. And if we think that I am not needed here, we're, we have deficiency either on our own thinking or the church is doing something, which happens sometimes, where maybe we've created barriers or walls or, ah, we don't really need you here. Uh, we don't want to be that way because that is unbiblical. Let me quickly read our text from last week. It begins at verse 14 in chapter 12. It says, Every, Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. So now if the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. Do I sound like a foot? Because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. That's what a foot might sound like. It would, for not that reason, stop being part of the body. Or if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, creepy image, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. And if they were all one part, where would the body be? And as it is, there are many parts, but one body. An interesting thing happened to me yesterday morning. I got up. And I know that Russ Johnson's thinking about creation, God's design is getting in my brain because I woke up with a sore eye. Uh, there was something in my, I felt like a flick or a dust or a piece of dirt or a flick of sand or something. So I just started kind of rubbing it and trying to get it out. And I sat there and I realized, you know, if I just sit here long enough, my eye has the ability to flush itself clean. You know that, right? Think of, think of how much stuff has gotten into your eyes over the last... 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of your lives. Lots of stuff, right? You walk outside on a, on a smoggy day, you get stuff in your eyes. But our eyes are somehow designed and capable of flushing and cleaning itself out. I didn't think much about it. I should have let it do its job because one of my people living in my house said, John, your eye is all bloody and red. I go, really? I don't feel that. So I looked in the mirror. There's a little bit of redness in it. But I was still reminded of the amazing capacity of our eyes to outlast us. We do. We donate our eyes at death, don't we? How many of you are signed up to do that? I am. We all should donate our eyes at death. Think about that. Our eyes last longer than our bodies. That is a pretty amazing thing that the eyes have the capability, the whole socket, the way the head is designed, and we can shut the thing off. But still, the eye is needing the rest of the body. You, it would be useless to have a little eye sitting there on a platform. It needs arms and legs and feet and a head and everything else to get around and do its job. It's an amazing thing, and that eye is an essential part of the body, just as each one of us is. So the first thing we can't say is, because I'm not like this person, I'm not needed. Because I don't sing well, I'm not needed. Because I don't have to get the leadership, I'm not needed. Because I don't have natural talents, I'm not needed. That is a lie of the devil and a lie of the church if we promote it and accept it. Number two, we cannot also say, I don't need the church. I personally, and be above and beyond that, I don't need the church or all of its members. 
Listen to chapter 12, verse 21. That I cannot say, these are profane words in church. I don't need you. And the head cannot, excuse me, the eye cannot say to the hand. Eye to the hand. Hi, hand. <laughs> I don't need you. I needed my hand yesterday as I was trying to get whatever it was in my eye out. I needed the hand. I don't need you. Or the head cannot say to the feet. I don't need you. Because what would you have a disembodied head sitting there, punk, <laughs> and thinking, boy, I'd like to see a little bit more of the world. No feet to do that. The head needs the feet. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And I think Paul is talking here about parts of the body that we're probably even uncomfortable talking about. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, we treat with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, God has put the body together, given greater honor to the parts of the body that lacked it, so that there should be the punchline, no division in the body. Amen. But that is part should have equal concern for one another. So on the one side, and they are both a type of spiritual pride. This church doesn't really need me. I don't need to plug in. That's, that has its own sense of pride to it. The other side is, you know, I am I'm way beyond this group of people. I, I really don't need what's going on here. I, I, I run into, do you run into both types? Would anybody care to admit you've been one or the other? Because they're both lies of the devil. You are needed, and you need each other here in the church. Now, I'm going to go a little off script here, so hang in there with me. March 31st is my last Sunday here. And the next day, Pastor Richard becomes your lead pastor. Honoring the request of your leadership board, I will not be here at all for at least a year so that Richard can spread his wings, have as much elbow room as he needs, and be able to freely try some fresh new ideas to lead FAC in this next, your next season of growth. Assuredly, he doesn't need me breathing down his neck. How many of you have had me breathe down your neck? It's not much fun, is it? Now, of course, I'm here to help if he needs a password or a contact. But one of the greatest blessings of all this is I get to do something I haven't done in four decades. What is it? I get to church hop. I get to church shop. Last time I did this was in 1985, four decades ago. And I have to admit, I'm a bit rusty at it. But that is exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to visit probably dozens of churches. And if I'm nice... Perhaps Diane will help me out. And the point is what I'm looking for and what I'm not looking for. Are you ready for this? This is what I'm not looking for. I don't give a rip what size the church is. I really don't care. I don't find anything in the scripture that tells me I should care, whether it's a church of a dozen or a church of 12,000. I'm not going to church to be entertained. There's a lot, a lot better entertainment out there than what you find in church. Trust me. Like I said, that's probably once in a while why I go to New York. I am not going to a church to meet my needs. Did you hear me? I'm going to come back to that in a moment. I don't, I'm not looking for a church to meet my needs. I am certainly not going to a church to make me comfortable. In fact, I'd rather go to a church that agitates me a little bit. Anybody understand what I'm saying there? I want a preacher who's going to agitate me a little bit. I'm not going to a church for great music, though I love great music. But can I confess something here toward the end? I would much rather spend a day with Doug and Candy going to some classical concert that they have selected than maybe doing a music marathon in the church. It's nothing wrong with the church music. I'm just kind of wired differently. Part of it is I have a bachelor's degree in jazz and a bachelor's degree in classical music, and that's what I gravitate towards. So in terms of musical pleasure, I'm going to probably go to Carnegie Hall and listen to what's performing there. In terms of worship, I don't go to Carnegie Hall. I come to church, which is something very different. Worship is very different to me than worship. And I'm not necessarily going to go to a church because they have fantastic preaching, although I think it's better that they do. And I spent a lot of time in the first four chapters of Corinthians belaboring the following point. According to Paul, you can take Paul's word for this, it should not matter if you are spiritually far enough along the road. I'm talking about spiritually mature people. It should not matter who's in the pulpit. Paul said, 
You know Paulus? That's great. And Paulus was, oh, Paulus was polished. He went to, probably went to school in Athens. He knew the Greek way of oratory. He could stand in the middle of a street and read the stupid phone book, and people would come and listen to him. Paul, oh, Paulus was good. Then you had, could you have, who else he mentions? Peter. Oh, goodness. I don't know if Peter was a good preacher, but he sure had more stories than anybody. That reminds me of the time we were out in a boat. And I saw this person walking toward us. Can you imagine having that guy as your pastor, as your lead preacher? Oh, I remember the time when I was, I was standing way far away. I, they, were, they, were, they were torturing Jesus. They were trying Jesus. And, and I, I wanted to get close, but I didn't. And this girl came up to me. I recognize you. I can't tell you how my heart broke to lie to her and say that I wasn't. I wasn't part of that group. The fear that came up. Can you imagine the stories that Peter shared? And then Paul. Can you imagine going to theology school? You just got a master's degree. Can you imagine studying under Paul? So you had all these great choices of people. And what did Paul say about all three of them? They are mere what? Mere men. Mere humans. They're just human beings. And he goes, and you are what? You are carnal. So I think people, I think... Good preaching is important. I really do. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing it. But I think our Christian life is not dependent upon who is standing here. It's dependent upon you. And if it is dependent on the person up here, that's totally okay. But it is, it is inherently an admission that, you know, I, I need to grow a little bit in the Lord. I need to assume responsibility. That's one of the greatest spiritual insights I've ever received is I have to assume responsibility for my spiritual life. Everybody with me so far? If you don't believe me, carefully read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. Saying that, I need to plug into church. I have to plug into church. And after Diane and I have decided where we're going to go to church, I'll have a conversation likely with the pastor, and it'll go something like this. Pastor, how can I help you? It won't be, think about this, it won't be how are you going to meet my needs? Because Christ meets my needs. My need is to help him build his church, meet his needs. And all of you here, everyone here needs to go up to Richard Finch, Pastor Richard, say, Richard, how can I help you? How can I help you? Some of you have already done that. I want to do it right now. Richard's right over there. I want you to say with me, Richard, how can I help you? Let's do it. Richard, how can I help you? Right? Rather than, okay, I wonder if Richard's going to meet my needs. If this church at this new chapter starts with the belief, okay, Richard's going to meet my needs, he will fail. He'll fail. He'll fail. So I want to ask each of you, use your text messages, use your emails, Use a phone call. Better yet, take him out to lunch. He's already told you where he likes to have lunch. Richard, I want you to succeed. No, I didn't say that right. That wasn't right. I want us to succeed. I want this ch church to blow the, door, blow the doors off. When I come back to this church, I want it to be packed with three services. And he's the guy that can do it. Only if you help him. You get it? You've got to help him. You've got to reach out to Richard and say, Richard, I am here to help you. So that I went off script a little bit. Is that okay? Back on track. Okay, we're going to look at the verses now. We're finally getting to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And this, this chapter has kind of a section, a kind of a theological section justifying love. Then it describes love. Then it has some more theological stuff about love. It's, it, love, it's like a sandwich. And this whole chapter, I think, is a filter to filter our thinking about how we should behave, always filtering it through the filter of love. I think a couple of weeks ago, I talked about bodily filters. We've been talking about the body, and we've got kidneys that filter, and we've got a pancreas, and we've got the lungs that filter, and, and all the things in our body, kidneys, that, that filter things out, right? We understand filters. Does anybody here own this thing called a computer? <laughs> Do you use it online? How many of you have shopped for something and used filters? Come on. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. I'm glad Josh is here because, Josh, you don't know this, 
but I probably spent five hours shopping for a hotel before I booked one. I did, because I, I, I enjoyed it, I had a fun time. I was determined to get the best hotel I could find in Tucson to hang out with Josh. Now, part of my plan failed because one of my search parameters was a swimming pool, and I found a hotel with a swimming pool, but what happened? It rained every day. I was there. <laughs> that was a total waste of money. So the filter system that I used um, for Tucson, number one was the location. I wanted my hotel to be less than 10 minutes from Josh so I could connect with them every day. And we did, every day. Um, and I was able to do that. I believe it was, it's called Eastern Tucson. It was a particular location. Then I had a certain price parameter, so I had that filter. The filter about price, how much it's gonna cost to have this hotel. Um, oh, then I had the next filter, breakfast. I didn't want to make breakfast, I wanted free, free breakfast. Then I got really picky, I wanted a hot free breakfast. <laughs> I can't remember the name of the hotel I picked, because it's, it's, it was a Hispanic name, I don't remember it now, but it wasn't a big chain, but found it, was, it met all the requirements that I have. So I, the filter was there so I could make a good choice. Some of you buy stuff on the internet. Clothing, I want the right color, the right size, the right material, the right make, right? And you use a filter. If you just type in, I'm gonna buy some clothes on the internet, you're, you're lost. We use filters to affect our choices. And I wanna suggest this love chapter is the ultimate filter to affect our personal choices, okay? Here's what I want you to do. I'm gonna ask you to do this again a little bit later. I want you to think of three sets of choices that you have made in the last week or two that should have been filtered by love. And maybe they were, maybe they weren't. I want you to think of a big decision you had to make. Maybe it was a, a big financial decision or, or a job decision. Something that we have, you, that was a big decision. It was the kind of decision I might make once or twice a year. If you made a decision like that, keep that in mind. Write it down. Number two, I want you to think of an interaction that you have with a significant person in your life. A significant person is a person you see all the time, family member or friend, okay? Just think of, where well, you had a situation where you had to make a choice on how to behave, and hopefully you made it motivated and filtered by love. And number three, I want to add this, a casual interaction. Um, I had several casual interactions <laughs> at Costco recently. I don't know why. I know why, because I'm updating my membership and all that kind of stuff. Had the face-to-face -face with the people at the counter. Wonderful interaction. Then people who knew me came up, and I'm trying to talk to this first time. They say, fabulous interactions. So think about those three things. A big decision that maybe you've made or maybe you have to make. Number two, a significant interaction with someone that's meaningful to you, someone that's permanent in your life. And finally, a casual interaction. And I want you to use this chapter on love to ask yourself, did I handle that the best way? That's your filter. Fair enough? You ready to do that with me? This is a more meaningful message if you're thinking about those decisions. Okay, chapter 13, verse 1. We find in the first three verses, I've counted them up, the first three verses, five counterfeits to love. Five things that try to pass as love. Five things that we have or do that we try to cram in there and replace with love. You ready for the five? Number one, love trumps a glib tongue. Look at the first part of the verse. If I speak in the tongues of men, the language is men. Well, there's a little, plenty of debate as to what that means. But I'm, I'm going to assume, imagine these are people that speak really well. The tongues of men or of angels. And there's a widespread belief among the Jewish people that angels kind of had their own speak their own language and whatever this is <laughs> Paul is saying that God, that love trumps a glib tongue I just like the word glib a tongue that impresses a speech that impresses that's fine and good and important Paul I would love to have heard Paul preach I would love to have hear, heard Peter preach and Apollos preach but he says just because you've got a glib tongue just because you have an impressive speech and I would dare say even if it's the gift of tongues which are fantastic and I think current and biblical today if you don't need love, what does he say? I'm only what? Let me, where's my stick? Where's my stick, Richard? You ready for this? I'll give you five seconds. Read it first. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but I don't have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging. There's two items here. There's a gong and a cymbal. Are they both there? Which one's the gong? 
Okay. This one, the gong? Yeah. Okay, gong first. <laughs> hurts me more than it hurts you. <laughs> now, they have their place. Well, I'll put it backwards. I don't want you to lose this for later. Oops. They have their place, but in isolation like that, that is what exercising any of the spiritual gifts are like if the person exercising them does not have love. Number two, love trumps wisdom, intelligence, and insight. Love trumps wisdom, intelligence, and insight. Look at verse two. I'm stretching this a bit, but the English language is richer than the Greek language, so I think I need to. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, whatever that means, this guy comes across pretty smart, right? Whatever that means, right? It means he, he knows something. We're not going to, this is not a sermon on what the gift of prophecy is. But this person is, is impressive in what he knows and says. What do I have? What's the rhetorical question? I have nothing. And then he goes on and says that love trumps faith, confidence, and inspiration. Love trumps a person who has faith, confidence, and inspiration. He says, and if I have the faith that can move a mountain, how many of us would not be impressed if we knew someone could literally move a mountain, right? And clearly Paul is remembering the words of Jesus who said the same thing. It's a person that really has, I said, faith, confidence, and inspiration, but I don't have love, I have what? Nothing. So, so a person with great faith, a, he's a great, he or she is a great encourager, is able to kind of move us ahead, but lacking love, Paul says, it doesn't matter. It's nothing. Then he goes on to explain that love trumps extreme generosity. That might surprise us. Love trumps extreme generosity. Verse 3, if I give all I possess to the poor, and how much more can you give to the poor than all? I guess you can pull out the credit card and borrow, but that's everything. If I give all I possess to the poor and don't have love, I gain nothing. Then the last counterfeit. These are counterfeits to real love. Unless they're accompanied by love. Love trumps personal sacrifice, inconvenience, and hardship. Look at all the suffering I've been through. Verse 3. If I give my body, body over to hardship, and some of your translations um, suggest this might be martyrdom. Not quite sure because uh, most of us don't give ourselves over to be martyred. We usually are martyred because someone else has taken control of us. But it seems to me that, in, as we know Paul, all the hardships, he listed them for us. Shipwrecked how many times, beaten so many times, whipped this many times, left for dead, so on and so forth. Love trumps personal sacrifice, inconvenience, and hardship. So we kind of learned what love is not. Now I want to jump to the end of the chapter uh, to look at some other brief theological reflections before I think we get into what is the meat of all this. When I say we're going to get way ahead, get way ahead, we're going to get eschatological, okay? We're going to touch on the issue of final days and the end times. Because what we learn here from Paul, he never dismisses gifts. He never puts down spiritual gifts. He never diminishes the importance of spiritual gifts, whether it's prophecy, healing, tongues, whatever. But he says in the, in the relevance of things, it's love that really matters. Verse 8 Starts with love never fails. And I, I really sort of think that's part of the previous section we'll see in a moment. But I think the verse should start on the word but. But where there are prophecies, they're going to cease. There'll be a day when they're not needed. And where there are tongues, they will be stilled. No longer needed. Where there is knowledge, they will pass away. For we, I, I, let me finish this first. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the completeness comes or the perfection comes, what is in part disappears. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Uh, the false view of this passage is when the completeness comes or the perfect comes. Some people think that refers to the New Testament. Once the New Testament's been put together, 
We don't need words of wisdom and knowledge and prophecy in tongues. That is not found in the text. That's a big lump. That's a big leap of faith to believe something like that. The perfection, of course, is what? Jesus coming back. And when Jesus comes back, when Jesus comes back, do we need the gift of healing? When Jesus comes back, do we need the gift of tongues? We have plenty to tell him. We're not going to be lacking words. And that's what he's saying here, that there will become this, this mature time, this complete time, this fulfillment of the ages. Yes, katan, if you want to use a fancy word. And those gifts, as important as they are now and today, and they are, they're all important today. There's going to be a day that's not going to matter, which is why we need to put love on top. He says in verse 11, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. And I think what Paul is saying here, and he's been really consistent through the book, going back to chapter 3, in terms of being a babe in Christ and being a mature person in Christ. There's a place for both. Again, I want to be more careful. If you're a young baby Christian, praise you. But if you've been a believer 42 years and that's still where you're at, uh, time to recalibrate how you're approaching the Christian life. And he is saying that here, that it's time to be a man. And I put childish, childish ways behind me. Verse 12 is an interesting verse. For now, we, now this present church aid, we only see a reflection as in a mirror. And the odd thing about this is mirrors, mirrors tend to be pretty clear today, right? Most of you have mirrors. But it's a pretty accurate. In fact, if you take a picture of a mirror, you're not quite sure if that's the original picture or not. But back in the time of Paul, they didn't have the type of mirrors we have. In fact, Corinth was well known for their exporting of bronze mirrors. How many of you have recently purchased a bronze mirror? Why not? Because they don't work. But you can probably comb your hair. And you probably can't see if you've got a bloody eye or not. But that's why Paul can say, we see now only in a reflection as in a mirror, which is less than ideal. It's less than ideal. But then, when Christ comes, if I can insert that thought, because I think that's what's in his mind there, we shall see face to face. Today, I just know in part. I barely get it. That's why we have these spiritual gifts. But then I'm going to know fully, even as I am fully known. In other words, I'll be able to see him, and I'll be able to see you, and you'll be able to see me as who we really are. Then he ties it all up. These three remain. These three remain. These three remain in verse 3. Not the gift of tongues, not the gift of healing, not the gift of prophecy. What, what remains? Love. Thank you. That's the third. The first one is faith, hope, and love. That's what's going to last for all eternity. Okay, so what I want to do now. Um, oh, I have this line. You can't take it with you. All the accomplishments of our spiritual gifts, things that we might be able to say and do that are spiritually gifted, we can't take that with us. The only thing we can take with us is love. Um, and this is an important point. It goes all the way back to chapter 1. I don't know if it's in your notes. So chapter 1, verse 7, reminds us that we're not looking for the gifts. We're not looking to what they accomplish here. We're always looking ahead to his return. Verse 4 of chapter 1, Paul has this classic thankfulness at the beginning of his letter. I always thank God because of his grace given to you in Christ Jesus. Verse 5, for in him you've been enriched. You've been gifted in every way with all kinds of speech and with all kinds of knowledge. And if you go on with gifts of healings and gift of tongues later. And God does confirm in our testimony about Christ among you. In other words, you were gifted as, a, as evidence that our message was true. And then verse 7. Therefore, you don't lack in any spiritual gift. That's a pretty cool thing to say about a church that was a mess in other ways, morally. You don't lack in any special you do not lack in any spiritual gift as you what you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. You see the tie-in? Let me really think a tie-in between spiritual gifts and the church, the church would be part of that, and him coming back. Verse 7. You don't lack in any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Now, the best part that needs no preaching, that needs no introduction. The love passage. Used in weddings and marriages and as it should.
but always to remind ourselves it's meant for everything. So the three things you're thinking about right now, a big decision you made, a significant relationship that you've had to make a decision in, and finally, some kind of casual connection you had this week where you had to make some decisions. My question, did you filter it properly through the filter of love? Because this is what it looks like. I've actually not prepared this next section. I just wrote it down as an outline. I figured it would come to me as we were sharing together. Again, this passage really needing no introduction. And what I noticed, though, were there are two positives, and then there are eight negatives, and then there are six positives. So I guess that makes uh, eight positives and eight negatives, right, if I add it up right? Two positives, it starts with things that you proactively do. This is what love expressing itself forward does, and then there are eight things that you don't do, and then comes back and he finishes with six positives. Number one, love is patient, and King James does it best. What does King Jimmy say here? Love is, we're a young bunch, aren't we? Long suffering. That's worth just those two words to think about. Love is patient. We get that. We use that word a lot, and maybe we, we don't understand it, but long suffering helps. It's able to suffer wrongdoing to itself for a long period of time. I think parents are long-suffering. You got to be. Yeah. You know, I got a little thing that says, you can't scare me, I'm raising kids. <laughs> you know? I used to put seven on there. <laughs> it's in my office. You don't scare me. I've learned to mean, not perfect, but I've learned to mean long-suffering. And then it says, love is kind. And I always think of my mom when I think love is kind. And I still think she gave me the best advice because she knew me. She said, I went my wedding day to Diane, my first wedding to Diane. She said, John, I think she's being put her arm around my shoulders, be nice to Diane. Have I done that all the time? Of course. <laughs> she here. <laughs> I tell you, that filter works for everything. Is this being nice? Uh, not really. Oh, yes. Love is kind. I don't know. My paraphrases. Be nice. So think about those events. Big decision. Significant relationship. Casual connection. Are you long-suffering? Patient? Patient. Sometimes we make, pa we make decisions in a hurry that are bad decisions. I mean, how many times have we rushed a decision that turned out bad? We just waited a little longer. Now, eight negatives. We'll go through this rather quickly. Love does not envy. It can't. It can't say to itself, I want that, even though it's not mine to have. I think that's important in young relationships where young relationships are packed full of selfishness. And if we can train our young people to realize, you know, love is not selfish. Love is not envious. Love is not jealous. Love is not always trying to grab something, figuratively or literally, that doesn't belong to you. Can I say that again? Love is not grabbing something literally or figuratively that does not belong to you. It does not boast. And, and the, word, the word there is, is, is kind of a puffed up word. Both the next two words have to do with kind of an expanded sense of importance. It's the person, I guess, who kind of sucks the oxygen out of the room over self-accomplishments. It's not proud. It's not puffed up. It's, and this proud thing goes back to chapter 12, doesn't it? Because it's the, it's not the, it's the person who, I don't need this group of people. I don't need the church. I don't even need my spouse. I certainly don't need my kids. That person has greater needs than they possibly are aware of. That's what our pride does. Number four on the negative list, it does not dishonor others. We will guard each man's dignity and crucify our pride. We sang that chorus a few weeks ago. I need to bring it back. Regard each one's dignity, and we crucify our pride. Does not dishonor others. And then the next four negatives. It's not self-seeking. 
what can I get, what can I get, what can I get? And you can just flip it around, it's giving, it's generous. It's not easily angered. There is nothing more unloving than an angry person, right? We've all, I mean, a person could be as angry as a hothead and tell you they love you, and you go, that, that, I don't see it, I don't buy it. It keeps no record of wrongs. And with the tablet and the phone, it's easy to keep a record of wrongs. I've got a special file for Deidre here. <laughs> I'm on page 64. <laughs> I bet you some have done that. Kept a mental record. Kept a digital record. Interesting things we're going to find when people pass away and we finally get access to their passwords, huh? <laughs> Interesting. Keeps no records of wrong. Then the, the last of the negative, it doesn't delight in evil. It doesn't secretly take pleasure at injury done to or wrong occurring to people we don't like. I can say right here now, if you have a secret happiness, and I've had this happen, and, it's, and it's, I'm ashamed to admit it, where I'm secretly taking pleasure that something bad happens to someone I don't care for. That's delighting in evil. And that is an absence of love. And that's a moment for me to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Because I don't think God does that. I think God weeps when something bad or wrong happens. That's it for the negatives. Let's race through the positives. It rejoices with the truth. I, I mentioned looking for a church. I, 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 didn't, I should have shared more of what I'm looking for. Truth is important to me. You know, if it was just a bunch of nice people hanging out, I'd join the Boy Scouts. Or the Scout Scouts, or whatever they're called today. But uh, uh, truth matters. Biblical truth matters to me. And so I'm going to rejoice with people who believe in truth. It always protects. You know, I thought about that. Protects. You know, that's why we drive our cars carefully. Because if I don't, I could cause great damage to another vehicle or worse yet, to another person. I need to be, when I'm on the road, my job is to protect not just those in my vehicle, but those around me too by careful driving. I had the misfortune when I was a teenager. It was not my fault. It had no consequences to me at all, but being involved in fatality. And it affects you. Maybe, thank God, maybe I'm a better driver having gone through that. But our job in all of life is to protect others, whether we know them, like them or not. It says it trusts. It always trusts. Well, we're going to put a little caveat on that. Sometimes people betray our trust or not that we have to be a lot wise and alert and thoughtful. But we should give people the benefit of the doubt as much as we safely can. It always hopes. It, you know, <laughs> I don't like being around pessimistic people. I like to be around optimistic people that really believe that their best day is ahead. I believe that for myself. My best days are ahead. And I believe that for all my children. And I tell them that all the time. Your best days are ahead. Then a lot, the next two are kind of similar. It always perseveres and love never fails. Now, how many would say God spoke to you a little bit in some of those big decisions on some of those filters? Pretty cool stuff. This is good. Thank you. I want to do something different now. And this is not original. I actually was listening to a number of sermons on this chapter. And this was done several times. So I'm just adding to the pile here. Is putting the name Jesus instead of the word love. And this sense has been a pretty cool description of our Savior. Now, for this to work, I actually just did about half of them. And if you have a bulletin, and you're welcome to take one, it's in bold. So the sentences, the phrases in bold work really well if you put the name Jesus in there. Let me do this for you. And you tell me if you think I'm wrong. Jesus is patient. Pretty good. Jesus is kind. Just read his interactions with women. Oh, if you needed just one reason to believe in Jesus, it's how he treated women. Women who were beaten up and abused and mistreated. He was so kind. I don't condemn you. 
he says to the woman. Jesus is not self-seeking. What, what does he need from us? Jesus is not easily angered. Slow to anger, the Bible tells us. Jesus keeps no records of wrongs. No record of wrongs. Thank you, Jesus. That's why he came and died on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, that you don't keep a record. He doesn't delight in evil. It says that Jesus always protects. And Jesus never fails. Finally, the hard part. I'm going to put my name as a representative for you in each of these. See if they ring true for you, okay? I'm going to, just because I'm here, put my name in as the subject of the sentence instead of love. And I want you to, in your own mind, do the same thing and see which ones you need to circle and say, I need work on this one. Get your pens out. Which ones do you need work on? I've already marked mine because I've been through here today already. John is patient. No, we're not putting it to a vote. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, no, we're not voting today. It's not a membership meeting. John is kind. John does not envy. John doesn't boast or brag. John's not proud. John doesn't dishonor others. John is not self-seeking. And again, you're, I'm giving you time to, to repeat that with your own name afterwards. John's not easily angered. John doesn't keep a record of wrongs. John doesn't delight or celebrate in evil. But John celebrates or rejoices with the truth. John always protects. John always trusts. John always hopes. John always perseveres. And John doesn't fail. So, my chapter today needs no introduction, does it? You've heard this all before. Are you ready to live it? Say amen. Amen. Father, thank you for this fabulous chapter. And it is. Thank you for the challenge of loving. It's not easy. Thank you for the realization of the temptation to be selfish and to grab our rights and to assert our position when you uh, call us to be gracious and humble and loving. Thank you, Lord, for this passage that we can every day memorize it, think about it, and filter every one of our decisions to it and come out way ahead. Lord, I pray for Ferndale Alliance Church that you will continue to expand our capacity to love graciously, to not fail, to not keep records, to protect, to guard our dignity, to honor each other with affirmations of value that every person here is needed and wanted. And I even would pray this morning that there may be just an awareness given to all of us of maybe one or two people here that maybe we detect in our thinking might not feel valued here. And we can just come and say, hey, I am glad you're here. Thank you for being part of our worship. I pray for the arrogant side of all of us that can think, you know, I don't need this stuff. I don't need church. Save my time, save my dollars, do something else. When in fact we need what the church brings. The opportunity to serve and sacrifice and give. The opportunity to grow. The opportunity to support others. Maybe we are more mature. It gives us opportunity to bring along those that need to move ahead. So bless our morning. Bless us as we sing this final song. And bless Ferndale Alliance Church. Amen. Take these hands and lift them up. 
For I have not the strength to praise you nearly enough For I have nothing I have nothing without you Take my voice, pour it out, let it sing the songs of mercy I have found, for I have nothing, I have nothing without you, and all my soul. Take my body, build it up, it be broken as an offering of love, for I have nothing, I have nothing without you, and all my soul. Let it glorify all that you are worth. For I have nothing, and I am nothing without you. So I'm especially excited about next week. We're going to have a big band. How many? 44, 48 musicians? We're going to have ghosts from the past. Ghost musicians from the past show up. And uh, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I will be there. And we're going to have a good time. Probably about 15 musicians, something like that. So you will want to be here, and you want to fill every seat here. And we can do that, right? So right now, think about somebody that would enjoy a concert of really good Christian music. I'm sorry, no Bach, no Beethoven, no Brahms, but some great Christian worship music will be here. So now, may God bless you and keep you. May God make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. May God lift up his, his countenance, give you love, give you peace, give you faith in his name. Amen. We'll see you next week. Amen.